technology. <laughs> Thank you all for having me today. I'm Jeremy Swink. I'm with Sandy Martin Holmes. Uh, today we're here to talk about a special use permit. It's uh, SUP 2016-3. It was approved in 2016 by another developer for the Westland property. It has to do with placing fill in the floodplain. We're proposing an amendment to that special use permit. I'm going to give you guys just a brief presentation of what we're up to, and then uh, have to field any questions that you guys have or hear any concerns that uh, we need to address. <clears throat> so the parent of 
SUP 2016-3 was with the Westland property. It was a uh, residential development. There's access off of Clean Lane. It was greater than 50 lots, so it needed a second form of entrance. Um, during the development process, or the pre-development process, um, the owner at that time went through a special use permit to allow a stream crossing, which you see in the upper right-hand corner here, going from their residential development down through the stream buffer, <coughs> crossing Powell Creek, and then accessing uh, Orchard, Dr Orchard Drive near the intersection of Jarman's Gap Road. If you look at the picture just below that, it shows the properties that made up the original West Glen development. And then you see down there in the lower yellow, which was where their entrance came out onto Orchard Drive. There's a close up of the same, <coughs> same thing. So what changed? In 2018, my company acquired both the West Glen development as well as the neighboring property for a total of 42 acres, give or take. Um, giving us two natural points of access, so one off of Kling Lane and another onto Blue Ridge Avenue. When we were going through some of our preliminary um, community outreach, which we typically do as part of any new development, um, one of the main concerns we heard with the development was dumping out a bunch of traffic onto Blue Ridge Avenue, which you know, isn't necessarily <coughs> large enough to, uh, or adequate for a large number of homes. And the same with Kling Lane. So the concern was all the construction traffic, all the neighborhood traffic, accessing this neighborhood, which is infill, and going out the existing streets. It became a concern of the bars as well. We heard, you know, we heard the voices in that room loud and clear. So shortly after those meetings, um, late last year, we actually acquired a three acre parcel down at the corner of uh, Jarman's Gap and, and Orchard Drive so that we could, um, with all these properties combined, put the stream crossing that was approved in SDP 2016-3 in a more optimal location. So there's a lot going on on this, uh, <laughs> on this slide up here. I might jump over in front of the projector so I can point. And uh, we have a copy up here as well, which um, I'm happy to leave during and after the meeting if you guys want to take a look at it. So here in gray, which you see going from the top left of the screen, coming down here was the original location of the crossing approved in SDP 2016-30. The red areas here, those are impacts to stream buffer. The orange areas, this is preserved critical slope. When we were at the community meetings initially um, with the neighbors, um, a lot of times when we're at those, we get some of the best ideas for our developments if you just listen. And one of those ideas was hey, instead of doing the crossing over here, why don't you move it to a more optimal location since you control the properties and take a straight shot from here down. That's what you see in green. Um, and the net impact there is what's in orange. So just by the numbers, oops, it's missing on that sheet. You just went by the numbers what was approved was 65,000 square feet of stream impact, 10,000 square feet of preserved slope impact for a total impact of 76,000 square feet. Our new location, um, 37,790 square feet of stream buffer impacts, so roughly half the stream buffer impacts and no preserved slope impacts. So we're basically cutting the uh, environmental impacts in half and that's you know, other than it being just a more straight natural shot to divert, being in the center of the development to divert traffic down this main entrance, this new main entrance in our the Germans Gap versus through the existing developments. Um, you know, we see a lot of merit in this project and we hope it's met with support. Um, are there any questions that I can answer, Mr. Dumbra? Uh So does that mean that there'll be, with the new picture you have, there would be less traffic on Kling Lane and less traffic on, what was the orchard? Yes, with, without, without a doubt, without a doubt. And that's why it's a worthwhile investment for us to do. How okay. do you come up with this less traffic on orchard? 
have 124 residents there. We've had school buses coming through, traffic trying to avoid the railroad bridge. And I cannot tell from your graphics what is it going to you When you come into Orchard, are you going to uh, go right beside it and go into Joinman Gap, or are you going to cut straight in a 90 degree angle to Orchard? Your, your displays are not that good. I apologize for that, Sean. I'm happy to. Could you put it back up on the screen? Yeah, please? absolutely. I'm sorry for the camera. I can't see. Oh, I see. So hopefully, there, there we go. Yeah, good. Good. good, good, good. Um, so I'm going to point here. You can follow me up there. Okay. So here, here's the cul the cul-de-sac on Clean Lane. Thank you. It's right here. Okay. Right here is the cul-de-sac. Use the screen. Very, very, the top, the screen. Uh, <coughs> very, very top. Left can't left reach it. Very top of the map there. Yeah. Um, we would have one entrance that brings. We can't see that. We can't on the big screen. Yeah, the I apologize. I, I, I can't reach it. It's, a, it's right the, the, the circle, the top top left of the, the top left of the screen. That's the clean lane entrance. The Blue Ridge entrance is on the very top of the screen. And the, Perfect. You're a bottle of sunshine. Okay, thank you. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. So this is the existing hole of second clean lane. This is the intersection of Blue Ridge Avenue and our development. Our development's clustered here, outside of the environmental areas, but it's all this area that's shaded and brown. So what we'll have is we'll have a way for the folks at Clean Lane to have a shorter trip to downtown or to come through here and exit down and go. Our traffic here, the quickest way for them to get out, straight down here, out, and gone. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Are you saying, so I know this, this vote needs two entrances by law, right? You need two exits. Yes, ma'am. That's all. You don't need... Three. That's correct. Sir. Are you saying you're not you're not going to build through Clean Lane? You're not going to build through the Blue Ridge? Or you're going to build through Clean Lane, Blue Ridge, and Orchard Acres? Our initial plan shows three entrances and exits for interparcel connectivity. I think that that's. Um, but you don't need three by law. You only need two. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you don't have to build through on Clean Lane if you don't need you don't need to anymore. If you build if you get a special permit for this, you no longer need to build through on Clean Lane. Well, there, there's already a special use permit for this. But we at one point did ask about keeping that a dead end, and, and Ms. Malquist actually thought that was a good idea, what was receptive to that. So what I'm hearing you say is one of these doesn't need to be built through. You don't need three. Am I correct? Uh, generally, in the planning process, planning would That's encourage what I asked you. By law, the fire department says you need two. The reason they were going to build this through is because at that time they couldn't build through Blue Ridge because um, that land had not been sold yet, so they had to build this special permit. So they needed to go through Clean Lane, they needed to go through here because they couldn't come through on Blue Ridge yet, because that was still private property, right? That's, Am I right? By law, you do need, do need two, two points of access for fire rescue. However, VDOT <laughs> requires more connections when you have more properties and more homes interconnected. So there is a formula through VDOT as well that does have to require that those connections. So at the time of the original West Glen, what was VDOT's requirement? That, that West Glen was, was, the size of West Glen is about half the size without these other properties More added in there. Okay. So well, at the time for West Glen, it was two. Can, I, can I, we just be a little quiet in the audience? And also, if, when you have a comment, just raise your hand just so we can um, try to be fair. So you're saying there's a narrow problem that there be three entrances? I think it's something that we're we're happy to work through with county and planning, but it's it's been my understanding that three is our requirement. Is that right, sir? I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, Scott Collins. Yes. Is that what the, is that what VDOT requires? Currently, they want a connection. Uh, we can certainly look at talk to VDOT in the county about that type of connection and what it might be. Um, certainly, it could be pedestrian. It could be emergency. It could be many different ideas. So, if there's a if there is a, a larger concern about having connection from claim to development, 
we'll certainly talk with the county and VDOT about other means as well. I, I'm, I'm Megan the Doc, so I'm with the county. Um, the one thing that we would have to look into is I know that the, there was a prior special use permit in 1990 that required actual that connection from Clean Lane to Orchard Drive. And so we would have to look and see if how to modify that, if that's even available to be amended to not have that connection to Clean Lane. So that's one of the the aspects of this. So um, you're saying as you're, well. closing, you're closing one of the exits from Clean Lane? No, I'm saying that the special use permit that was approved in 1990 required this right. connection, which is why the West Glen property had to make that connection. So. Okay. But it is, yes, you have an exit right now at a clean lane that comes in the orchard and turns right. The majority of traffic, as it is stands now, comes down orchard. It's even so. I don't understand why you need to come into orchard across the stream. Can you, can you yeah. clarify? Yes, yeah, so the, the that stream would, crossing that, yeah. was the condition of the yeah. original old old yeah. SP. So the old 1990 SP required once they got above the 30 units required the connection to Orchard Drive. And just to add to that, why can they not come out on German Gap directly? Th that's um, a VDOT spacing issue. Yeah, that's... Sorry, I need Daryl Muller. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So does that mean you are going to open a clean lane and you're not sure about opening the call to we'll, we'll certainly take feedback under advisement. It's... Um, it's been my understanding through the pro preliminary processes that we've been through that there should be three entrances. But again, I'm happy to take the concerns I hear here today and we can modify that as, as we work through the process with the county. Now keep in mind the Kling Lane connection, we see it more as an entrance from the back neighborhood along people along Kling Lane, residents along that road in order to have an access through our development to downtown or over to Orchard Lane as opposed to, as to, to winding around what you currently do. I don't see, from traffic distribution, I don't see much, of any, of the residential traffic from our development going out that way unless they're going to visit other residents. No, and, that's and not true. But even the guy, the guy from West Glen, he said to me, oh yeah, they will take me because that's the way to go to 64. That's the way they will go to work. They will cut down Kling Lane, Go right to Orchard and get on Lane, lane, uh, lane Town and go straight to that's how they'll go to 64. But that, takes you, that takes you to Jarman's Gap. So you don't know our neighborhood. So the way we go to 64 from Clang Lane, you go down to Orchard Drive, we turn right. We go one block, we turn left on Lane Town. We go to Jarman's Gap, we go straight onto Three Mile Road. Right. Then we go that. right, and that's how we get to 64, and that's what those people will do too. That's they right. You have to get to Jarman's Gap. Drive. And if you look at it, the fastest way to Jarman's Gap. It's going to be straight down this road, out to Jarvis Gap right there. That is a much easier shot, straight shot to Jarvis Gap than winding oh, all the Oh, you're saying you can go down there and go yeah. to Jarvis Gap and we go take right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Possible, yeah. Okay. Can, I, can I ask the people who, I, it's great we've got a lot of citizens here who, who are going to be directly impacted. How do you feel about this argument that there's also a benefit to you here in the fact that you can come into downtown quicker and so forth. Does anyone see this as a benefit? No, no. absolutely not. Even down the road, I'm very quiet. We say, nope, I don't see that's my drive. You can't get through the drive. She said the benefit. May I ask another, another question? Else? So if, we, if we're able to take the clean lane concern to planning and try to vet that out what's the best for the most people. Um, clean, excuse me, sir. The clean lane is not the major problem. The problem is all of the traffic coming down Orchard from 124 residences plus all the construction. You are going to have one major bottleneck. I still don't understand why you can't go into the bridge. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get I mean, it's a because, disaster. Because of VDOT. There's not, not enough VDOT space for... Let's have VDOT here and explain what their, sometimes explain what their concern is. The other issue... I, I guess um, one, one question I wanted to pose before we go too much further, because this is really what's germane today. I know there's a lot of concern, and I'm happy to 
hear them and take them into account and address them. Yeah, just summarize it. It's a traffic on Orchard Drive with additional stuff coming in that's already crowded. That is a major, major issue. Yes, sir. Is there enough benefit? Do people see the benefit in moving the crossing from here to here? So if under the assumption that there is a crossing, are folks in agreement with me that the green is better than the gray? Because that's, I mean, candidly, that's what we're here to ferret out tonight. It's a yes, much less of a disturbance of the sensitive areas. So I would think so. I do too. Yeah. When a resident, and I'm not going to, um, you know, name where they live, but when they suggested in the community meeting that we move that, it was like, a blinding flash of the obvious to me that that's where it belonged and I wish I would have thought of it so what what is going to how are you going to get over that sensitive area is this a, a bridge of some sort or box culvert, box culvert crossing very similar to the design that was approved for the, for the original. Yeah, it's, it's similar to what's here just moved down quite a bit and you'll see the impacts because of the grades here were much more severe than the grades here, you'll see that this impact of the stream is actually much longer under the old plan. Yes, ma'am. At the end of the green roadway there, is that more located centrally into the first phase of your new units that yes. people then will not have to go way over here and come down? They'll actually use We're that. Right in the center, so the heart of the community mm -hmm. right here. So it's so more almost, likely they will go that Almost way. all the houses mm -hmm. are here. We do have one cul-de-sac that goes down there. Not nearly as many houses. Yes, sir. Just focusing on the issue you're talking about. Uh, did I understand you correctly? I'm just trying to understand that there would be about half the amount of disturbance on the new path versus the old one. As yes. far as environmental. Con uh, in terms of uh, WPO buffer, so in terms of stream buffer, it's uh, 67,000 in the original, 67,000 square feet in the original plan were 37,000. There were 16,000 square feet of preserved slope impact. They go away completely. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. Yes, sir. Thanks. Is it still, it looks like it's still pretty steep at the beginning of that. Is that right? Yes, it is. And you guys know it well. You drive past it every day on your right. It goes down, I'm going to guess, 8 to 10 feet, just looking at the conduit or contour lines here before it hits the bottom. I didn't understand what you said. What kind of crossing do you do? It's a box culvert. You probably drive over them all the time, but you don't I notice it versus yeah, a bridge. Yeah, they just replaced one of the Yeah. That's right. Well, that's what about the one that's right? Isn't the one on the It's It's basically a big square concrete pipe where the stream goes basically through the pipe. Basically, the beginning of Clayland. I mean, not the beginning, but the beginning yeah. of the crossing. Right? Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. That way, the thing looks like a better solution to me. What it provides, but I'm, I, I want to, I'm concerned about clean lane being really actually a spread of shop for people living there because it's just straight. It would be easier for them to live through clean lane rather than doing there and having to deal with uh, sign and conjunction. So I hope you can find a way to uh, either uh, the best would be to get out of the dead end because of a lot of kids on this street and it's a very peaceful street. I agree. Then, uh, Thank you. That would be the best solution. And otherwise, it would be pretty hard for people to take that in terms of, if it's a spec shop, everybody's going to go this way. Makes sense. I, I agree that the new alignment definitely encourages more folks to use the main, the, what's going to be you know, a wider anybody, street section. It would encourage that those would be closer to the exit, but I think many other, many other people are going to go put in there. But it's a straight, straight shop. And yes. So uh, I hope you can. Yes, sir. One other question. If the idea is to minimize the environmental impact, is it possible that you have two other exits and you don't have to build something going over the stream? I think that's something we'd have to take up with planning. Um, I think that the width of this section, this road, is going to be built to a higher section than either of the other two existing exits. Um, it would be, I have, a, I have a strong preference 
that a well-built entrance with an adequate width located in the center, center of the community is really going to incentivize our neighborhood traffic to go use this versus the other streets. I don't know if you've, um, if you've been on Blue Ridge or Clean Lane. Um, they're not built to the standards to which this will be built, and I think it's just going to be a much more um, used entrance. Yes, sir. Um, it seems to me that both of those options create an intersection on a blind curve. I don't understand how VDOT would have approved that when they could have approved something coming down onto Orchard, uh, onto Jarman Gap, where there's a straight shot where you can see uh, oncoming traffic. It seems like a very dangerous intersection, no matter which option you choose. I've spent quite a bit, of, I mean, there's very good sight distance in both directions here. It's How can it be a, a, a good? The road's tied into the curve at the, at the out, on the outside of the curve, which gives you directions both down this road, this side of the road, and this side of the road. I agree, if it was on the inside of the curve, you would have zero sight distance. Mm -hmm. But being on the outside of a curve, yeah. that's the ideal, yeah. ideal spot. I disagree. I think we're going to have accidents there. And this is a, just a neighborhood full of children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But has to approve the site distance and make sure. That's right? absolutely so correct. They'll check that. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually check it before we get this far. And they'll double check us. Is that true you're talking about the apartment? Yes. They're taking the house down, I guess. Yes. On this property here, the Jarman's Gap, uh, there's a lot of foot traffic here on Jarman's Gap Road. Um, and we just thought it would be something, you know, to me, a better neighborhood is having our houses clustered here versus putting some here and some here and some here, which was on the original plan. So we were going to talk about taking this area and turning it into a nice park and open space so folks walking up and down. Germans got to have a little place to stop. I think it's a nice use of the land, honestly. Are you also considering, now that you own all this property along Powell's Creek, a, a, a trail along there, or is there one? Absolutely. Greenway yes. dedication that goes, we pick you, and Scott, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong here. It picks it up here at Jarman's Gap, comes down along the, following the stream buffer to our crossing, crosses the stream, follows straight back here. So your road will bifurcate that? But yeah, our, our, that our road will actually help bring <laughs> pedestrian traffic across across the stream. I work um, I work very closely with the Crozet Trails crew and Dan Mahan over at Amaral County Parks and Recs, and uh, they know I'm a friend and. Uh, that I'm thrilled to be working with them on another project for the Greenway. Could you talk about the units that are going to be built? Uh, sure. What, um, what about them? About uh, are they single? I, I, I'm not. They're all um, the plan. So we have sing, single family attached plan for the neighborhood. So it's townhomes and villas. Okay. Uh, it's minimum. I think is two sixty four, and we're talking about opportunities to add affordable housing to the community that. Those aren't approved yet, but we're talking through them. You got R6 by right? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's 260 units just in that upper right what is now Pleasant Green, plus 75 to 80 down on uh, Bells Creek that was originally. Sorry, no, ma'am, total, oh. in total. So combining all 42 acres. Okay. So what's down on Tall Street, that's all 260. And then what price do you um, consider an affordable house? Uh, Right now, Albemarle County is two forty three seven fifty. Is the I think that's the index. So Which you, is called talking? workforce housing, but eighty percent. Yes, eighty eighty percent, percent of AMI. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, so you have two hundred and sixty homes in Europe, rather than including the affordable homes in two hundred and sixty. You're at you're asking that you add additional homes to the two sixty by right. We can, we've considered requesting um, bonus density, which is typical in uh, buy right development for uh, providing ADUs. Uh, it may, and I hope it's something we can pursue, but again, there's, uh, I think there's a lot between now and then that needs to happen for, for that to become a reality. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, is your new development similar to the one you have uh, off of Rio Road in the new section that where the uh, Belvedere? Uh, the villas in Belvedere. Yes. Very similar. Yeah, we have we have a, quite a bit of that product. Uh -huh. You'll see it. You'll, it, yeah. you'll see it at uh, Glenbrook as well over in Foothill Crossing. Uh -huh. We have that okay. product. Yeah, that's okay. It's just. So I guess here. concisely, what are you asking of this group today? We are asking for an approval to move the stream crossing from this location to this location. This location includes a tax map that wasn't originally on the original special use permit. <laughs> So we need an amendment to the special use permit to include that to fill in the flood plan. So it's a required community meeting right. for them to move through the process. Yeah, but I was just trying to yeah. stay clear. The, the, yeah. the, the it's real crossing. purpose of this is really just this it's roadway crossing. Yeah. It's either in this location or in this location. Yeah, that's correct. And that's yes. it. That's, that's really the whole story. Yeah. So can you still use the special use permit that's given for this other? If, if the new yes. location wasn't approved, I'm fairly certain that that's the route that we would have to go. You can still use that. That was already approved to the other developer. You can still use that? Yes, yes ma'am. It, it, the special use permit runs with the land, and we're, we're beholden to it. I see. Yes, sir. On, on the old one, though, uh, Jeremy, isn't part of the trail uh, tentatively uh, along that way? <laughs> you mean? Uh, the, the gray, the gray area, yeah, that you're talking about. I saw it, and I'm going to have to go back and look at the plan. I thought <laughs> that the trail easement, again, follows down by the stream buffer and ends up here. Okay. Because so they, they didn't have the property here to tie into Jarman's, so there was no, the greenway would have dead ended somewhere here, and then gone up and followed a similar path to. Yeah, so our, our concern, trails, is that we want to continue to make a walkable community, so you'll be able to get now out, out to basically Jarman's Gap without going on orchard. I mean, it kind of looks that way. Yeah, tremendous, a tremendous benefit in my opinion. You know, there's uh, several trail locations not far from here in Jarman's Gap. Either way, we look forward to helping create more of them, and I think it's a wonderful benefit to be able to walk from you know wherever you're coming from and pick it up at Jarman's Gap versus walk along orchard or or somewhere else and keep it. Keep the greenway internal to a neighborhood. And well, you're right. We, we bicycle down Jarman's Gap, and there's <laughs> always people walking. And so our focus is again, we want walkable crozet, basically. So it looks. I'm just. I'm kind of. You know, I'm kind of being point, pinpointing about it to make sure that that's incorporated in your design. And what I heard you say it is absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, that is the best thing for the most people. And I can tell you that this linear park up here and the trail is the thing one of the things I'm most excited for this development. I'm excited for a lot of things about it, but that is uh, that's at the top of my list. All right, thank you. All right. I, I just wanted to say a couple things. This is the beginning of the process just to give you some information um, that the required community meeting and then from there staff will be reviewing the application which includes VDOT, engineering, um, planning, zoning, we'll all be giving comments um, at the beginning of May. And then from there it goes to a public hearing with the Planning Commission. The public is um, invited to come and speak and then to the board for approval. So that's the process. I have cards if anybody wants one. Um, but I'll be the lead reviewer if anybody has any questions about the process and, and county. There is one more thing that I wanted to say that shouldn't go unsaid. We've actually some, we've drafted and submitted a set of plans at our expense in this location. It would be really important to me to divert as much of the construction neighborhood traffic from day one onto this road as po onto this road as possible. So we have construction plans for our first phase that are going through the county process now. And just as soon as I can get um, an approval to start a road, be it this one or this one. We're going to start our linear park in the road so that all of our construction traffic is going through there versus the existing entrances. <coughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. So if any of you can pay for that, need some um, Vegas info or Mary's info, um, I'll check Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
Some, some of the things, well, all the people are here from from Fling Lane and from the uh, from Orchard Acre. It, it, from my perspective, as far I was here in 1990 when Fling Lane uh, was approved, and it was always to be a connector. The, the difference in that connector that that's that's going to be here now is that that was supposed to connect to the second phase of Fling Lane, which would have been another. I think it was 30 homes versus 260 homes. <laughs> but that connection was always there to be connected. Uh, so just to clarify that, you know, that's, a, that's what... Well, and it about. sounds like Megan also said that it was... Right. It's a it was part of the... It's part of the, the of there is already a uh, yeah. special use permit that that is supposed to be a connection. And uh, I guess the other, the other side of that, too, is that to, to me... If with this, because of the uh, the building on Blue Ridge, which the view of 126 apartments, you know, the, the more entrance into the exits to diffuse the, the traffic does seem to make sense. You know, so, but I, but I, I would support this, you know, the, the, new, the new alignment. Hey Tom, would you speak up a little bit so we can hear back here? Yeah, I, I was just saying, what it is now, I would, would support the new entrance. I think it's preferable to the, the prior one with, its, with, with more environmental impact. And I think, it, as you said, it's still on the same curve, but, uh, you know. Well, and it also, I think, makes a more desirable exit for the new construction, you know, concerns that they'll take clean lean. Um, I, I feel like a shorter, straighter, road is going to be more desirable for the residents, so. Yeah. All, all that said, I think the committee should understand, though, is after our last meeting with VDOT, that this is going to compound the problem immensely with uh, the view and, jo and Jarman Gap and the intersection in Crozet Avenue. So I think, you know, there's nothing we can do. It's a buy-right development, but, you know, something's got to, going to have to give somewhere sooner or later. Sure. Can I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. That connector, we did know that that was supposed to be built through to a second development. So was that supposed to connect all the way through downtown, or was it just supposed to connect to 30 houses and then stop? From, from my understanding of my memory, since you're talking about 1990, is that it was going to connect, it would be essentially a straight into the second phase. From what I remember in 1990, there was no talk at that time about any other connections other than those. So it still would have been a dead end. That would be a great question for me because we don't know. But you can, you can, you can ask, yeah, probably the county would give you a better answer. And I just want to say, for being plain, I do understand the concerns also about Blue Ridge because Blue Ridge is also, right. you know, I'm, I'm just heartbroken that there's an apartment complex. That was a beautiful, beautiful street. And, and it's heartbreaking to see it. And I don't understand how that road is supposed to handle the traffic through the apartment complex. I, I don't get that at all. Well, you realize it was never supposed to be an apartment complex. That the, that the, the community spent months and months in discussions with the Piedmont Housing Authority to build a mixed-use um, development there, which had, would, would have had both affordable and, and market rate. The P PHA turned around and sold the land 
to the developer, and the, 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 they already had the, um, the what you mean, their permission to build at a higher density, so they they took it. But I just want you to know that that was never meant. You mean the one that's being built now? Yes. The view yeah. department. Yes. All right. Well, so do we want to vote on our resolution or our? Yeah, it's been offered well, a second in yeah. And personally, I'm going to abstain, not because I have any concerns with this. I support the proposal for all the reasons you guys have shared. And maybe this is a question for another day. I just want to have a conversation about whether it's really our role to be having votes on projects. I think it's really important for Anne and Jenny and all the other members of the public to hear our comments and for us to hear the other comments from the public. But I would like us to express our comments and not necessarily vote on things. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have no objections to it. Procedural. Well, the, way I see, that conversation the way I before. see the vote is just uh, that we want to, we're only voting that we are going to submit comments to for the packet. So we're not actually voting on anything. Like we're just voting that as a group we would yeah. like to submit something formally to for the supervisor and the planning commission. But we can have a longer discussion about how we should communicate with the board and the planning commission at some point. Well, it is within your charter if you choose to vote and send any communication to the That's how I understood it. That's what's written there. That's, so that's uh, something that's up to you all to decide. Issue, okay. issue by issue. It doesn't have to be right. like it. And that's how we've operated since the beginning. Right. Yes. Could the motion be read again before the vote? Is that Josh? Yeah, roughly. Um, I guess I made a motion to support the new alignment of the road pending its going through the county process. But as presented today, it's a better solution that we support. Okay. Thank you. With less environmental, you also I said yes, with less environmental, yeah. yeah. Can combine those? It's pretty short. All right, do we have to do a Thanks roll call vote for this? I don't know. No, no. Just, no. no. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. All right, all in favor of Josh's motion? All right. All right. All opposed? Mm -hmm. Nobody is, except for everybody. Okay, now we're ready for Josh. <laughs> we're here, we're ready. Thank you. Well, good evening. I'm Brian Kahn. I'm John's public relations marketing manager, and beside me is mobility manager Mary Honeycutt and transportation planner uh, manager uh, Stephen Johnson. Uh, tonight, we're going to give you a brief overview of Prose Connect. It's an express service to Charlottesville's destinations that's slated to begin August 5th. Uh, we'll briefly touch on the service's features, uh, benefits for Croatians. Of course, I've been here 20 years. <laughs> Rosations, the dependence on community input. Uh, transit planning obviously is a two-way uh, street. And a uh, peek into the planning process, or how the heck do we make this work? Our process has three major steps. We want to empower residents to own this. Uh, we'd like to get and share their input and insights and plan the next steps. <coughs> So, the Crozet Connect is all about making connections. Now, a number of you may work at UVA or Centaur Martha Jefferson Hospital, and that's great because if you do, we can take you directly there. But if you happen to work elsewhere in Charlottesville, then we'll be able to connect you with other means of alternative transportation, um, such as the Charlottesville Area Transit, also known as CAT. CAT has about, or CAT has 13 routes that can connect you all throughout the city. The Crozet Connect can also connect you to UVA's University Transit Service, our 29 Express, and Charlottesville even has these really cool electric scooters now called Bird and Line, um, as well as UVA's U Bike Service. Um, but the main thing is that we're trying to get out of you all today and trying to figure out when we're doing all this planning is where do you want to go? I'd like to offer a little bit of insight into the transit planning process. Now, when we get in our cars, we all wish that the experience was like this every time. Uh, but when you live in an attractive and desirable community like Crozet, sometimes we find our morning commutes look more like this. And when we do get to our destinations, parking can prove to be a real challenge. Now, driving still has a lot of advantages, and we're not here to take away anybody's cars. But transit has alternatives as well. 
there are individual benefits. Uh, it's safer to take transit, transit per mile. You get to do more productive things with your time. And you don't have to worry about parking. There's also a lot of community benefits, such as reduced congestion, parking demand, and benefits for the environment. And these tie into a lot of the stated goals in the Crozet Master Plan. So we'd really love to work together with the community to put forward a transit alternative for those that would like to take advantage of it to help realize some of these benefits for the community. In order to do that, we need to build a high quality service. And there's really three components to that. The first is the where. We need to make sure that we can get stops that are close to where people live and work. We need to make sure we're providing shelter from the elements, something we often take for uh, granted when we're driving in our cars. And we'd also love to provide access to nearby services, whether that's waiting in a coffee shop for the bus or getting to go to a grocery store at the end of your uh, afternoon commute and save you a trip later. There's also the aspect of when. We know that Crozet and Charlottesville are not that far apart from each other, so we really want to provide an expedient service. Our goal is to provide a maximum ride time of 45 minutes or less, so that's just the first pickup to the last drop off. We also understand the need to minimize people's wait time getting on the bus, so uh, having really good proactive communication with folks about when the bus is arriving. And we also understand that people's schedules change. Sometimes you may need to stay late at work or take an unexpected trip to get somebody, somewhere. So supplementing the service with other options like John's current demand response or the guaranteed ride home program, we want to be able to offer a portfolio to make sure everybody's transportation needs are going to be taken care of. And then last is thinking about how. We want to be able to provide attractive pricing for taking the service. Our goal is a $2 one-way trip. And we also want to work together with UVA and the city of Charlottesville to make sure there are good parking options for commuters. So you can have a discounted parking rate and still drive to work on those days you really need to and take transit on the other days. We also want to provide a comfortable ride by making sure that there are amenities like free Wi-Fi and USB charging during your trip. Now reaching for this high transit standard does create a couple of challenges for us. With a 45 minute travel time, that does limit how long the route can be, which means we can't go everywhere. We also know from our surveys that there is a variety of different work schedules and we may not be able to accommodate everybody. So we'll probably need to start with the most predominant work patterns and serve those first. We also know that transfers can be a real challenge, so we'd like to do some unprecedented inner service coordination. We'd love to, for you to be able to get off of a jaunt bus and have a CAT or UTS bus there waiting for you that you can step right on. So that's something that we'd like to explore through this service. And lastly, we know that the topography and infrastructure in Crozet can present challenges. This is not a very high density area, so that provides, doesn't provide as many obvious places to put stops. So figuring out how we're going to get folks on the bus and how they're going to get to those stops is something that's really important. And we want to be partners in the planning process that if there are changes you want to see to your community that will make transit a better service for you, uh, we'd like to help in whatever way we can. So in terms of the community input, there were two surveys done in 2016, a UVA survey and a JOT survey. And that established the foundational justification for this service. Now we've got funding put forward to create the service and we're re-engaging you to finalize the details of what version 1.0 of this service is going to look like. So we want to find something that's going to set us up for success and really prove that transit can work in Crozet. And then going into the future, every day we operate we're going to learn more. A year after we start we're going to be able to build a better transit service than, than day one. Um, so we'd like to build on that success into the future. If, if the transit solution doesn't come to your neighborhood on, on the first day, we hope we can work, work with you to make sure that it will in the future. So in terms of what we're going to be working on in the next couple weeks, we really want to engage the community, helping us finalize these details of version 1.0. And that's really going to be a three-step process. First is looking at the alignment. We need to make sure that the vehicle is moving on major roads where they're not going to hit a lot of traffic, they're going to be able to cover a lot of ground, and still hit as many of our hotspots, our points of interest, as possible. Once we know what that alignment's going to be, and we're confident we can stay in that 45 minutes, we can start looking at specific places to put the stops. We want to get them properly spaced, 
as well as bringing people as close to their destinations as we can. And then once we've got that, we'll be able to calculate our estimated times and put together our version one schedule. All right, so as we already mentioned, we are heavily depending on all of your feedback. There's gonna be plenty of convenient opportunities for you to come see us speak and hear us talk about the service. Um, we plan to be at every CCAC and CCA meeting from now until service begins. Um, we, Jaunt, are hosting our own public meeting here at the library on May 15th at 7 p.m. And we will also have flyers available always at the library. We have a stack in the back right now that has a nice little list of all of our information. Um, in addition to providing feedback in person, you can provide feedback via social media. All you have to do is go onto Facebook or Twitter and all you have to, and just um, put the hashtag Crozet Connect and give us any feedback you'd like to, for us to hear. Um, for example, if you, you can post a photo of where you would like a stop to be and just include the hashtag Crozet Connect for us to see the information right away. Or you can ask us questions. As you can see, Claudia's Crozet is curious as to when the Crozet Connect service is going to start. And just because he included the hashtag Crozet Connect, we were able to see it right away and respond. I can't follow that up. <laughs> Sorry. So, but the main point of all this is, we want to know where do you want to go? And we look forward to meeting with you all again and hearing from you online. In conclusion, we'd like to field any questions that you might have. Uh, is there a way to provide feedback not through social media? <laughs> you can it's attend our meetings that we go to. Is there any way online? Um, can we email? You can email us, info at ridejohn.org. You can go on our website. You can call us. You can speak to anyone. You can ask for me or Stephen or Brian, and we'd be happy to speak to you. Yeah, oh, there's, of course, yeah. Those aren't the only ones. Those are just the creative ones. If phone, if phone and email are not on the flyer, we'll make sure that they get on the next version. Yeah. That's a good point. Thank you. Could you put the slide with the schedule of public Yeah, and there's a um, flyer back there, too, that I can give you. Um, okay. yeah. Are you envisioning this as a Monday to Friday thing? Or including week? We know that there is strong demand for a Monday through Friday commuter service. Uh, we also know that there is demand on weekends, both for health shift workers as well as recreational use. Um, we've heard of interest in reverse commuting, bringing people from Charlottesville out to Crozet to go on wine tours. Really? So we're open-minded. We're in. We're in. We're, we're open-minded to serving whatever needs the community has. The challenge is going to be figuring out where to deploy our limited resources to try to put out the most successful first step at, at transit as we can. And on a typical, I've never taken junk, but like on a typical Monday, um, are you running this thing all day, or is it really concentrated ab about like the morning? and then bringing people back in the afternoon, you're not really doing much midday? How does it, how does it work? We think that there is demand as well as we can measure. We think that there is demand for an all-day service, so that's what we're gonna try to do. But more, more runs at the peak times? Mm -hmm. Most likely, yes, because okay. we know there's a lot of heavy demand. There. And you generally have a park and ride concept. Uh, people are going to be driving to a single spot to pick up John to go into town, if it's a commuter concept. We are very you, excited. We have a lot of cars. In or you can bike to them. Sure, you can. Bike and ride. Walk, walk we're, we're very excited for the opportunity to develop partnerships in the community for park and rides. We see a lot of potential there to connect with some of the commercial opportunities, like we mentioned. We'd love for a park and ride not just to be an empty parking lot, but to right. have amenities like coffee shops or grocery stores that you'll be able to take advantage of as part of your daily commute. Is there any thought to uh, integrating this with Perone so that people, you have park and rides, but you can have a pony going around bringing people from neighborhoods to the way the bus is going to be? Yeah. Yeah. That way you're not you know, swallowing the parking lots out of it. That is that first mile, last mile problem of how do you get folks from home, their homes to the stops.
That's a heavily discussed problem in transit planning, and one of the projected benefits of autonomous transit is being able to solve that problem. So we're definitely interested in the potential for Tony to contribute to that. I have a couple comments. One is I've never ridden drunk, but I will tell you that I've arranged rides for people that have no transportation. Manual laborers, I've, I've supplied two people that have come out of jail, can't drive, to get jobs in this area, and they could not do it, period, without John. It has been wonderful. And then the other thing Thank I you. want to say is I happen to see, because I seem to visit more doctors than anybody I know, <laughs> I see you all just delivering people all over the place. I saw them yesterday at Martha Jefferson, and I saw them at the eye doctor. They are the kindest, most thoughtful drivers I have ever seen. Literally, gentle, kind, and thoughtful. And I think that really is good. Accommodation to you all. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We value our drivers. Yeah. They're wonderful people. Yes. Uh, are you aware of during school, when school's in, that, for example, Old Trail Drive backs up half the yeah. way? And versus the summer, if you if you looked at it during the summer, there is Different. no traffic. Uh, yeah, as you've heard during introductions, we have a number of our staff that live in Crozet, so we have a lot of good insider insight into the traffic. Uh, hot spots. Just to, uh, so you'll burn about 45 minutes up just waiting at that stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just to say we're, we'll, we're not just going to talk the talk, but in a way walk the walk. Uh, uh, I know myself and, and Robin, who live here in Crozet, we will be taking part in preliminary rides uh, in, to, to dial in everything. So if there's something wrong, We'll, we'll have something to say about that. Yeah. Well then, to finish that comment then, uh, and you know that Crozet is in the growth area, so mm -hmm. it was 5,000 people in the 2010 census, it'll be over 7,500 uh, yeah. next year. I mean, I believe the build out might even be higher than that. Okay, and lastly, have you ever considered uh, bicycle rides? There's a lot of, there's a three notch trail group that wants to connect Crozet to Charlottesville, based on what we've heard so far, it's going to be years and years and years. But there are people that want a bicycle, and I'm just wondering if that may, you know, alleviate some of the congestion. So have you ever considered that having bicycle racks in the front and back of vehicles? My expectation is that the vehicles will have bicycle racks. And we'd be pleasantly surprised if they were. Uh, yeah. you, 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 yeah. I'm getting nods from the from How many of your buses already have it? Yeah. They, yes. Yeah. Well, it really helped yeah. that. Okay. Well, I, well, I, well, I well, got well, concerned well, looks from yeah. I think <laughs> yes. I think you're so speaking you to a very strong bicycle <laughs> advocate here. Okay. And it is that type of community. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Gentlemen in orange. What kind of cost are we looking at for the community and for and or for the riders? That's a very good question. Um, Brad, if you can speak to that if you like. Mm -hmm. Your question was, what's the cost to the community or and to the riders? And to the riders. Um, if we reach the ridership expectations, the cost total is about $9 a trip. The cost to the rider would be about $2. Each direction. Each direction. Each direction. Each direction. Each direction. And do you have a, I'm, again, have never ridden John, but do you carry a card with money on it or do you just pay cash or how is the transaction done? So we have a long, long history of accepting cash and check. We understand that we're, we have some catching up to do, and we're in the process of implementing technology right now. So we expect by the end of the summer to have new technology in, pay, in play to support uh, things like smart cards or mobile ticketing on cell phones. So you just purchase the ticket through your phone and just show the, the phone to your driver and it'll let you off. No question? I have a question with it. I'm from over the mountainside, and mm -hmm. we have quite a few residents over there that would like to have a way to get to Charlottesville and back, but we don't know what to do. Do we take a petition and send it to you people, or? Uh, What's the name of the community you're referring to? We can take that back. Mountainside. 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 Oh, Mountainside Seat. Uh, yes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, we would love to engage with the community and figure out 
we would love to engage with the community and figure out what kind of opportunities there would be for us to fulfill those transportation needs. So I'm sure we could schedule a time for Mary to come out and meet with the residents of the community. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, that would be nice. Yeah, I would love to do that. Because, I mean, there's, there's quite a few of us that are more we're hanging Yeah. Yeah. And I've been in Mount Tess for three years. I've been here at John Transportation. From here, from Crowley to Charlottesville and that. <laughs> It seems like Charlotte looked like Propane on the end of the, the map to nowhere. Oh, well, I'll come to the mountainside as we can you know, we'll work on that, okay? Thank you. Uh, one of your slides made reference to Guaranteed Ride Home. What is that? Yes. That's a program that's uh, offered through the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. You go online to make an account, and then there's a service agreement that up to, I believe, three times a year, five, three times a year yeah. you can call and get a, a ride home and the cost is covered. I believe it's in conjunction um, with ride share. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So in anticipation of launching this project, we are going to be preparing welcome packets. And one of the things that will be in there is all the details that a new transit rider would need to know to take advantage of that program. Yeah. Um, but the idea is, you would be able to take transit, and if something happened and you needed a ride home outside of the transit schedule, they've got you covered up to a certain number of what, times per year. Would they use taxis, or what's the mode? It, it could be. Yeah. There's, there's certain other uh, uh, modes of transportation that will honor uh, vouchers. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Yes. So, at the same time, you also mentioned John's demand response program. Can you... Explain what that is? Sure. So uh, most of our service is door to door, curb to curb, in on a reservation basis or on demand. So uh, when our clients, customers need a ride, they call. They say, I have to go to work, or I have I, I want to go shopping, or I have a medical appointment. Can you pick me up at X time? time and, and yeah, I have an appointment, and then we come back. And so that's on demand. Got it. No, the disadvantage of that service is that there's the uh, reservationist will probably communicate with you a, a pickup window, so you would need to be available for maybe 25 minutes, and you're not sure exactly when the driver is going to arrive. So it's it's not as consumer friendly, maybe uh, knowing exactly, being able to time everything, and like like you would know with the fixed route exactly when the bus is going to arrive. Okay, what's the cost for that? It's four dollars okay. each way. Uh, you mentioned the, the surveys before between UVA and John. I think mm -hmm. I actually took the UVA one uh, a, a while back. Could you just, I mean, so in, in terms of getting feedback about, and I think part of it is you're, you're trying to get pretty granular and like where you want to go and where you want to be. So just based on those surveys, right, if you just look at that data, could you give us a sense of like, all right, based on that data, here's where we would go, here's what we do, here's where you pick it up, here's where we drop you off. Just, and then maybe you might be able to like respond to that or say like that sounds good or that sounds good. So we definitely got insight into specific dimensions of the survey. The challenge comes from looking across questions. So we can look and see, oh, this was the most highly demand drop-off location. So we'll go there. And this was the most highly demand demanded drop-off time. So we'll go there at that time. But we don't have the information right now to know that those two things correlate, that all the people who asked for that location were also asking for that time. Um, UVA conducted that survey and, and their survey was more extensive and they had a larger market to advertise that survey to so there were a lot more responses mm -hmm. and not having the raw responses there's only so much so much analysis that we can do okay. um, so yeah as we, we we do know based on those surveys what were the most popular times what were the most popular drop-off locations? Could you, could you let us know what those are? Or were they? I have, the, I, we don't have them here, right here, and, oh, and it was done a while ago. Oh, okay. If you're interested, I'd be happy to yeah, give you that information. Okay. Follow up. Right. Um, well, maybe at least at your public meeting, you would yes. have those. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was all. Gotcha. It may be helpful just to get people started rather than the blank page. If you had some of those yeah. initial yeah. things for responses, Same it may be quicker for you to get yeses and noes or something or a handout that we fill out. Yeah. Yeah. And the other yeah. preliminary is, is there a geographic outline such as 
Great Value, Old Trail, and Harris Teeter, and no further out than that. And I don't so that when people are making suggestions of pickup places, we know that's sort of the outer boundary, or 240, 250, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So you're not wasting time with somebody who's like, I want, I want to come to the basement or the white hall or something. Yeah. <laughs> not, not on the table. <coughs> Um, so yeah, the number of pickup locations on that survey was limited, so definitely we're going to be engaging the, the community in the next few weeks to make sure we have the best understanding possible about specific pickup and drop-off locations. And would you be willing to give us a, a ballpark number of pickup locations that realistically could, could keep you within your 45-minute goal? I mean, are we talking three or seven or 12? Um, so the most important thing and the first thing we need to find is the alignment. So what route is the vehicle taking? Um, once you've got that, the cost of adding extra stops that don't deviate from that alignment is pretty low. Um, and it would depend on the frequency of, of sort of those hot spots to determine how many stops we would have. You want to strike the right balance because if you have too few, then people are having to travel too far to get to the stop. If you have too many, then the bus is stopping too frequently. Um, so it's, it's striking that middle ground and we don't have enough information yet to know exactly, oh, six stops is the right number uh, to hit that sweet spot. But that's something we'll be discovering as we move forward. Okay. 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 Just two quick things. Very excited that you're coming to our Project Community Association <laughs> meeting on May 9th. Yes. There is no CCA meeting on July 11th. That's the one month we take off on our. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. No, sure. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll also mention um, that we are not meeting at Crozet Library next month because this room is not available. So, um, TDA. Okay. okay. Thank what, you. I don't have a location for that. Yeah. Another question? Uh, so, for the pilot and for its initial part, I'm guessing there's like a minimum number of ridership you'd like to be able to get, but I imagine there's also a maximum based upon the number of vehicles. So what's that range for, or do you need more input before that can be assessed? I can answer that better. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks, <laughs> 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 Thanks, boss. <laughs> but just not relative to the vehicles as much as just the time of day and, and operational hours. Um, initially, we're running vehicles that have a capacity of about 23 seats. We also have other vehicles that are 28. But based on the initial demand and ridership, we can quickly start to work on ordering large vehicles to get them in place by the time that demand is reaching that capacity. So demand will drive the future vehicles that we can purchase. And the window to do that would be in those first few months when the services uh, are going. We can then pull together the uh, grant application and all that information and get that going. Bigger buses take about a year to produce. The vehicles that are going to be operated take about six months. So an interim solution could be to put more vehicles out to the fact that we increase capacity. <coughs> Just quickly, when, when is sort of the uh, time frame of, of actually we're seeing jaunts, jaunting around Crozet? August 5th? August 5th, August 5th, August 5th, August 5th, August 5th is, the is the target date.
Good to go. All right. Cool. Um, so it's exciting that we're back at this again. Um, we started this last month, but as we anticipate the Crozet Master Plan update starting later this year, um, we've been revisiting a couple topics. Um, so to reiterate for anyone who wasn't here last month, um, we're anticipating to start the Crozet Master Plan update in fall 2019. Um, we're still wrapping up pan types right now. We're pretty deep into document production there, so we're um, kind of slammed there, but after we get that all done, uh, we're gonna start to scope out the project, the engagement process, and how um, how we'll attack this process, because we know it's been a long time and there's a lot we need to do. Um, so last one, we talked about transportation, so that's gonna be good. A couple job folks still in the room, it looks like. Um, today we're talking about parks and green systems, and next month we'll tackle future land use. Um, hopefully I'll have a little bit more time for that discussion, because that's there's a lot in that chapter. Um, so to recap what we talked about last month with the transportation, um, we talked about Route 250, the interest in maintaining the rural road character. Um, we also discussed the need to address the interchange development with, the, with this plan update um, through the public process. Um, some concerns with Crozet Avenue involve the um, queuing on the northbound lanes in the afternoon hours, but also some questions about what alternatives are available, especially in the wake of the um, upcoming bridge replacement product, project that beat up um, Joel discussed here last month, and I believe the public hearing for that is next Wednesday here at the Crozet Library at like 5 o'clock. I won't be in attendance, but that's going on, and I think that will be certainly um, something we should probably look at with this plan. Um, Eastern Avenue, continued prioritization of the southern portion, the Lincoln Hole Bridge, we need to look at the northern connection. Um, bike paths and talks we touched on were connectivity out to Eastern Crozet, neighborhoods like Highlands and Wickham Pond. Um, and also coordinating with the Jefferson Area Bike Ped Plan and U.S. Bike Route 76 downtown. Um, had a couple people emailing me about, about parking issues around there too, something that needs to be addressed um, as part of a holistic transportation solution for Crozet. Um, transit, this is a timely bit in here, but coordinating the new AV shovel Tony um, that Ron's putting on with the John Crozet Connect. I think there's, as I think we've heard tonight, there's a good opportunity to see what works and make sure we have a holistic program here to address that issue. Um, and then obviously, of course, coordinating with land use recommendations, making sure we have the right infrastructure in the right place, and hopefully at the right time. Um, so, of course, if you have any other comments about transportation, please send my way. Um, shoot me an email, and I'll keep adding it to the list. It's going to keep growing until we start the process and start scoping out um, what we need to tackle during all of this. So, with that said, we're going to shift over to parks and green systems. Um, this chapter plans so hopefully um, never had a chance to read it before last time. Um, so to a quick recap of some of the goals from that chapter, the emphasis is all mine, mine on this. Um, these are the, this is the language from the master plan, but basically protect our sensitive uh, natural systems, preserve public areas of topographic, historic, or cultural interest um, that contribute to Crozet's unique character, um, create areas for structured and unstructured recreation, so active and passive opportunities for recreation, link neighborhoods, um, that's a pretty big thing, but mostly to downtown, schools, parks, um, in a larger region. Um, protect and preserve Crozet's mountain views from light pollution, so, so sort of the dark skies theme in here. Um, link rural area trails to downtown destinations, protect areas shown on the Parks and Green Systems Plan, um, which is this. So real quickly, we'll walk through some of the major um, themes of this and some of the major projects before we start to kind of discussion Q&A. Um, again, environmental features is a major component of the Parks and Green Systems Plan. Uh, the rolling terrain out in Crozet and the foothills and the stream buffers really drive the form of both our development areas and our green system. So obviously centered around the uh, Licking Hole Creek watershed in the basin um, kind of drives where developable areas are, where we have to have stream crossings like we discussed earlier tonight. Um, county code provisions do include in the water protection ordinance a 100 foot protective stream buffer on perennial streams within the development area and others rating protections for preserved and managed steep slopes. Um, these are slopes that are related to, um, can, they can be man-made, they're more managed, but preserved ones are related to um, you know, major hillside systems, watersheds, streams, etc. Um, we did identify some areas within stream buffers as appropriate for redevelopment. Um, these are all, all existing areas, and some encroachment might be permissible with appropriate mitigation. Um, that's kind of a hash area shown in um, hash green over the yellow, shown here in of course, Crozet Avenue and Railroad Avenue, as well as a portion out here on Three Notch Road. 
Um, we did talk about two types of open space in here, so some that are existing, some are not. We talked about privately owned open space, which is what's currently held kind of by HOAs, so your common area of open space as, as required under the subdivision ordinance, but also areas held by civic groups, so Project Claudius Crozet Project Park, or areas under conservation, conservation easements were shown on this plan. Uh, but other open space also included a couple recommended areas um, for preservation, so things like landscape buffers along 250, and, um, and Three Notch Road as well, or new private open space I could develop. Um, so to jump into the parks and public open space, which are kind of the, the heart of this plan as far as a public implementation standpoint, uh, we did include community facility locations in this chapter, so the Crozet Library where we're standing in um, was a part of that. We also talked about potential locations for public parks and what kind of programs would be a part of it. So we're gonna jump into that part right now, which is a public park opportunities. Uh, so Western Park's probably one of the biggest ones, the one that's had the most progress um, since that point, although it has not been built yet. Uh, again, that's about 36 acres out of Old Trail, <coughs> developed in phases. Um, there's a no in the 2010 plan about CIP funding being delayed about that, uh, but I know that we did go through the master plan update process for this park um, 2017, finished in May 2018. Um, so that's been updated in a relatively fresh master plan for the park. Um, that was informed, I believe, through the needs assessment that Parks and Rec did, and of course through, um, and I think that was my first time out at a CCAC meeting was the kickoff of that. And just a little update, with nothing written in stone, there are ongoing negotiations of public-private partnership to get to phase one much more quickly. There's money in the bucket, and we just have to figure out how much else is needed to, be, to get it going. So hopefully within the next couple of months, something will be ready for announcement on that. Awesome. Glad to hear that. So that's the, that's the Western Park. On the other side of Crozet, there was a discussion on an Eastern Park, um, which would be on a high point in the eastern side of the development area. This is paraphrased from the text, uh, but would have trail access points be similar in size to Western Park and have a mix of um, recreational uses, including sports fields, trails, etc. Um, so this was outlined in the 2010 plan um, with mint on long-term implementation of it. Um, if this was in the document, so I'm throwing it up here. I will note that um, as of now, there's some overlap with what's currently common areas as part of Westlake Hills, that development's happening. I believe there's some alignments with the Crozet Connector Trail as well, um, but that's a project that has not had much implementation since 2010, but it's uh, currently identified in the master plan. So I wanna make sure that when we're visiting, we are talking about this, and that we can see if this is still something that needs to be on our radar. So that's real quick, Eastern Park. Um, other parks we talked about, um, what the expectations are for smaller sized parks within the area. Um, we expect, you know, we hope that with new development comes usable open spaces, green spaces, gathering points there. Um, with new, new development and some redevelopment, so um, for example, the, the square with the barns lumber redevelopment would be something that would kind of fit in that category. Um, school sites could provide um, field space. There was a mention of a trailhead park, about three acres, that would be well located on Crozet Avenue. Um, there wasn't any other uh, mention about location in there. I think that's yeah, about three acres. Um, and as well as pocket parks and greens from higher development. Um, greenways were another big part of this, connecting neighborhoods to each other and with downtown. Um, it called for partnerships and volunteer systems, and today we have the Crozet Trails Group, which we had a couple um, presentations from, and we have a couple members of the audience, I see. That's fantastic. To touch on greenways again, um, there's supposed to be opportunities to connect neighbors to each other in downtown. They mostly follow stream corridors and stream buffers and provide connections to urban sidewalks and bike lanes. I think that um, we talked about, I don't know, I talked to Steve a little bit before the meeting, but again, how do we use kind of greenways instead of maybe provide pedestrian access to transit, et cetera. Um, so a bigger picture there. Uh, again, calling for volunteer system like the trail crew and key linkages included the Crozet Connector and other trails to downtown schools, et cetera. So that's the real quick overview of the Parks and Green Systems chapter and just what recommendations were called for and the general concepts we're talking about um, in 2010 when we last did the master plan update. So I want to guide a nice discussion about four general themes here um, and four questions. Are there emerging needs for parks and open spaces in Crozet? And if so, what types and where? <coughs> Um, so are there areas that are underserved, don't really have access to um, you know, a pocket park or the like? What, are the, what and where are the missing uh, key trail and greenway linkages? So where are we missing trail connections? Where are there still, um, maybe what ties into the transportation discussion we had last month about where we're missing you know, paths and the other places to connect neighborhoods. Um, 
if you have the plan handy, are there areas where the language or the recommendations are kind of problematic or may conflict with other parts of the plan? Um, and are there recommendations that are not really relevant or outstanding today due to um, development changes or just our needs as a community have changed since then? So I want to open up the floor to talk about this. I'll go pull up a Word doc and take notes on that, but those are the four questions I want to start off with. Um, so, what are, are there any emerging needs that we think have come up since 2010, places that we feel are not served and kind of fell behind in terms of having access to parks and green systems? I would guess from here east is what it was, Sandy Drove from Westlake Foothills Crossing. I was surprised to hear about the Eastern Park because I never yeah. heard of it before. This is my first time. Yeah. Yeah. Are you Rachel, you know, have a recommendation? Yeah. I mean, they did save those trees in Westlake, but wow. So. Yeah, is that land owned already by the county or is that just high in the sky, that 35 acres that will be the Eastern Park? It looks like it's currently dedicated in the Westlake Hills HOA. So I'm not sure if there's any other discussions about um, greenway easements or so on with that process because it was a by right development. Um, but it'd be something to take a look at to see is, are there any opportunities there. I would think from what we heard tonight that the um, Orchard Acres area might need additional open space and parks just because there's going to be such intensive development there. And I don't know what those developers have committed to, but if they don't commit to stuff, then you know, that might be something the county should look into. Can I ask a question on the, uh, on the development and, that they presented tonight? Are they still obligated to the 25% open space or that doesn't? I think so. I think so. Okay. And I think they're actually above that. Or they, because yes. that, that would There's fall so all much all the floodlane yeah. 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 um, That does include critical slopes. And depending on how that plan goes through the county plan, if you look, if you remember on Jeremy's uh, picture, uh, the corner there of Orchard and Jeremy's Gap, there's a house there now. That's all to be a park. There's a trail down it, and um, it will exceed, as Ann said, the, the minimum requirement. So as that goes through the process, because the gal, I forget the planner over there said uh, it's just starting. As long as that's retained, yeah. that will be perfect. I mean, it'll be a big plus for Jose, I should say, because they're they bought the house and they're going to invest the money, and basically they're not going to get much out of it other than goodwill to the community. Yeah, it's uh, and and the east. Eastern Crozet is pretty underserved right now. Um, it, you know, being looking at like Highlands and Wickham Pond, one of, the, one of the problems is getting the trails were cut off by the railroad track. You actually can't get back to the trails. And this ties in with something we talked about before, transportation, like the, the necessity for those like sidewalks or multi-use paths to get into Western Ridge and then access the trails. So yeah, the Far East is pretty cut off. Um, another concern is, is even if Eastern Park were to be a thing, um, Again, we, like the eastern like highlands of Wickham wouldn't be able to access it because you couldn't get across the train tracks. Um, you have to find some other way to access. And it seems to me too, the language in here, so if we're talking about like problematic language, the language about Eastern Park, if it ever happens, about like having fields and sports, it just doesn't seem to jive with what's like the access there, right? There's no roads you can actually get in there. So it seems like it would definitely be more of a passive or just an open space with very sort of passive activity. I think in 2010, the possibility for rezoning on which the county would get the school site in Foothills was still alive. And so that was a whole different landscape than it is now for that. Playing fields and that kind of thing. Andrew, could you pull up your map quickly? Sort of the, the master park map for a second. I mean, sort of building off some of these comments about Eastern, um, uh, I've often thought that there isn't much going on to connect Beaver Creek with Crozet and the, I don't know if it runs the whole way, but the Parrot Creek. Uh, yeah, Parrot Branch from the elementary school all the way over. 
which could connect like Crozet Avenue right. and Crozet Elementary with sort of a, a more northern uh, east-west biking walking path would be would be really nice. Isn't that what that uh, yellow line is supposed to be? Yeah, that's what it was. Like. You were asking, what do we need? We need what we've got right now. And that goes oh, is that that yellow line? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a yellow line. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's just put that yellow oh, line. So, so keep that on as well. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Right. 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 That's proposed. Well, and, and tailing off what Joe said a second ago, you know, crossing the train track seems to be the big problem. Maybe pedestrian connectivity across the tracks should be a priority. Yeah. Multiple, yeah, there's multiple places where that's an issue, right? Yeah. Down east, downtown, all those, yeah, there's a couple places. Well, we actually looked at not crossing the tracks and coming behind Highlands and on the 240 side. Uh, and it comes down to easements. If we can acquire some easements, I'm just telling you from the standpoint of building a bridge at a million bucks or at, at minimum, yeah. or um, trying to get the easements, it'll be a lot easier to uh, acquire the easements. But that's our biggest challenge in that whole map, and that was question number two, Andrew, is what is in, uh, you know, is impeding us from actually building all that? Our biggest challenge is the county acquiring easements for us. Because we build it. Okay, can you show from us where on the map that is? Where's the pointer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. pointer. Can you take the pointer? <laughs> so, what? Where's the castle? Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Don't look at it. So, are you, are you talking about uh, Beaver Creek here? Because we actually have a trail that goes around two thirds of it right now. Right. And that actually is partially going to be destroyed when they raise the dam and uh, it'll be redone. But um, that is good. This guy, in, it's, this gentleman right here pointed out, this is pie in the sky. We need to get basically west. Uh, and anything you see, as you see over here, it's a major greenway or trail, but this isn't built. <laughs> I mean, so, and, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, but our biggest challenge literally is uh, acquiring the easements. If we get the easements, we end up uh, within a short period of time, a short period of time being within six months of a year, we, we get a, a, usually partner with the county, by the way, uh, which is great, Parks and Rec, they are great, uh, and uh, they help us build it or we build it. Uh, now, was there a particular question? What was the... We were talking about trying to get over, over or around the train tracks. Okay, so you're talking about the, the tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, there, right? yeah. Okay, and I'm talking on this side. Um, let's see, that's isn't that Western Ridge right here? Yeah, that's yeah. The bridge. Okay, so that's that's the bridge. And what I was talking about, we looked at some time is basically going on this side of the tracks. Now that would open up all that for that folks because the biggest issue right here is 240. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever ridden, we have folks that ride their bicycles down there. We do. Bicycle ride twice, uh, not what Jim does in serious stuff. I mean, we do a casual bicycle group uh, a couple times a week, and we meet at the mud house. But the point is that people ride down that road, and that is like, dangerous. that's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, just out now, dangerous. And yet, and people run down. Well, and, yeah. and, our, and our goal really is, I mean, we, we're realists too. Uh, you know, talking with uh, um, uh, Ann, what's Denozio or the uh, Joe. Joe. Joe, Joe, yeah, um, the V dot guy, you know, this here, and um, it costs almost a million dollars a mile to build a trail, a multi-use trail. Uh, so our goal is obviously how can we do this on the cheap and get something out there so people can use it. And like I said, our biggest challenge, and I'll, I'll emphasize it again because you're going to hear me say it four times, is if we can get assistance getting the easements. We can put, I mean, we can figure out how to do it. We can put in gravel, we can put a dirt trail, we can do something. And it's amazing the amount of people. It's like, a, what was that, a field of dreams? You build it and they're going to come. It's amazing. We build a trail or build a bridge, and we're seeing people left and right coming on the trail. But in answer to your question, I apologize. The bottom line is we need this, these uh, right here, the easements. And Vito, so like I don't know if Vito. properties you need to get highlands to the existing railroad crossing so they can get to the rest of the tracks. 
So it, yes, because you get over to the bridge here, and then you can. There's a sidewalk on that bridge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and Vito used to own this. I don't know if he still does or not. Is he still the developer for that, mm -hmm. Vito Chetta? Western Ridge is all finished. Oh, not Western Ridge. Uh, Wickham Pond. Wickham Pond. He was. I yeah, he was. One section. He was the developer for that. But the point is, if we can get this, and you know, there's the little medical center right there, mm -hmm. and then. And there's something right there, and I don't remember what it is, but if, and it looks like from a, right you know. Right beginning, yeah, yeah, it's in the white Yeah, preschool. Line. If we That's could get a, a six-foot path, and by the way, the Dan has taught us, as Dan Mahogany, you know, the Greenway Trails Planner for the county, basically, as long as you don't charge money for a trail, and you, you can dedicate that easement for a trail and can't be sued. And I don't think a lot of homeowners understand that, because we want to assure them there's still some people that think, you know, uh, you're going to build a trail and it's going to bring, you know, crime and all that. In fact, the statistics show just the opposite because people were on trails and they are actually there then watching what's going on. So if you wanted to do, Andrew, I'm saying let's talk to those folks and, and behind Wickham Pond here. And because at one time we helped Vito with a few, a little trail back here, but we can connect Highlands to uh, there and then behind there, and then as uh, Ali said, you can go over the bridge there, and then you get back to the uh, Crozet Connector Trail, because on, um, that's Park, I think that's Park Ridge Drive, yes. we build a little connector down to the connector trail, and that, that's the spine, that's how we look at that, that's the spine in all of Crozet, and the, and the centerpiece is the park. You should be able to come to the park, and then go up okay. either east or west. I mean, that's, that's basically this plan, and we want, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, but we want somebody from Old Trail or Jarvis Gap Estates on the west side to be able to walk, bicycle uh, to downtown, and the same with Highlands or Western Ridge, or, you know, we want the same. Uh, not only for it's environmentally smart, but people, you know, they get out, they get exercise in, and I know I'm going on here, I'm giving my speech, but the whole point is, put on your list, if you would, like I said, if we can we can get that um, easement right there uh, behind the preschool, and then uh, you know those two developments, and there's you know there's five HOAs in the uh, Highlands, so it's a uh, uh, yeah it's it's matured over time, and there's multiple HOAs, so you got to talk to all of them. And, but, but I, I like your speech, but um, <laughs> well, go back, go back, go ahead. The things that are yellow line. Are the easements already? Uh, yeah. No, yeah. no, they're not That's all there. The Those yellow lines mean absolutely. That's not. a. It, we <laughs> wish we had a trail. Oh, who's the school? So, Jeff, so the question more sort of, I mean, obviously the specifics are important, but like, I mean, since we're thinking broader here about the piece of the master plan, yes. when you say assistance in obtaining easements, yes. are there procedural or structural things? I mean, could we, I mean, are things in the plan that we say, hey, we're going to promote trails? Is it, you know, we need the county attorney to be able to dedicate to help with legal it, assistance? Is it a it, matter of, of homeowners cooperating? Or is it yes, a and yes. And Corey, I'll give you an example. Corey Farm, Dan says he worked on this, what, in 10, 15 years, five years? Uh, because, and Corey Farm let us use a piece that we want to build a switchback trail down, uh, eventually have that uh, Eastern Avenue, you know, between 240 and 250. But we're talking about, I'm not going to take Ann's thunder away, but she's working on something, so in a couple months we may have an idea to go in there. But anyway, having said all that, um, uh, all of what you said, we can we we have to basically talk to the homeowners. I mean, we have to be reasonable about it. We have to get their approval. Uh, sometimes that's a long involved process. Sometimes not. Yes, the county attorney gets involved in some of those things. That's true. Some of it, and I will tell you, and it's not because Jeremy did this, but uh, Stanley Martin gets it. And when I say they get it. They understand it's a value to create a trail system and connect to it, not only for their sales, but, and, and I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, I've known Jeremy a little while, but I've known Drew over 10 years, and the guy is trying to make the community better. And having said that, um, anytime they build something, one of our first questions is, okay, how are we gonna connect to it? We're working with them on Chesterfield Landing, which you know is on Crozet Avenue, and we're already talking about um, a trail, I've already flagged it, we're going to, this on our, our, our vision this year, if you will, to create that, and then, and it's, I won't say who the developer is, but there's one piece of land in between that uh, 
that we have to get permission from a developer and we're going to be able to go onto the Prose connector chart, which just takes you everywhere. I'd like to explore what, what Joe was just talking about, though. It sounds like what you were saying was, is there somebody who's accountable to accomplish these tasks? Yeah, yeah, is there somebody the in the master, community who... Yeah, either master plan or other things, might, we might put in there and expand and say, look, we, you know, as the trails and as we do this, are there resources, are there things that the county can provide, right? Like right. We, we commit to you know, legal resources or, you know, in addition to just financial, I mean, are just, there, are there just general leadership to, to focus yeah. on this particular this question. Department yes. is going the to easement up, right? is a... Is there like a fact sheet you give to a landowner that, is, that may be signed by the county attorney yeah. that says, here's Standardized what, forms. Yeah, here's our form, right. here's answers to, you know, frequently asked questions, here's the answer about liability questions, and, well, and I don't know. Any other and, kind of incentive. And yeah, that is good. It helps make it easier. I'll tell you what, I'm looking for the person who's actually going to create Yeah, and let me, let me address that because Dan Mahon is the Greenway Trails Planner for the county, Greenway Blues Way Trails Planner. And they've just, Parks and Rec, after what, 10 years in, they finally got another staff member, finally. But he's, he's got the whole county to deal with. I mean, his shoulders are this broad. And Biscuit Run is real hot right now, so right. we, and I hate to say this, but we're pushing him all the time because we're in Crozet and we want Crozet built. Yeah, that's and, not and, exactly. and, and that doesn't, but then they've got Keswick, you know, they, there's what, four growth areas in the county, right? So, yeah, or how many? And the, yes. point, the point is that uh, we need more resources in the county to be able to get us easements, bottom line. Now, how that's done? So, my question is, what can we do? What, what could the trails crew ask of the CCAC, us individually as citizens. If we know that guy that comes I mean, out. what? Yeah. What? Yeah, what can? I would. What I would like to do, and I think everyone is so supportive of so many initiatives around here, but once in a while, I think we we need to be tasked and say we need ten people to do this and help us accomplish this goal. And I think so many of us would be willing to dedicate. Uh, some time and effort to a really worthwhile initiative. I think a lot of us sit around here and we're like, just ask us. We'll we'll help do it. What is it that the common crozation could do to help you with this easement issue? I think discussion in your neighborhood associations to, to sort of help people commonly understand all these things. And Valerie's idea about the fact sheet to get everybody started is a spectacular one to make sure everybody has a play field to start from. Because people in this group and around the community know people who could be persuaded, especially face-to-face, person-to-person, neighbor-to-neighbor, is the way to succeed with this much easier than having yeah. someone they don't know go to their door and ask them to please dedicate this. Uh, it took Jack Kelsey two and a half years to get the easements for the streetscape for 16 landowners. So it just, that shows sort of how complicated things are when you have uh, lots of people's completely valid interests. We have to recognize that. But I think there's a lot of uh, job owning that citizens could do with other citizens that would help to raise their understanding of how beneficial this is and how important it is. And I'd like to give you two particular things, if that's okay. Uh, one is Parkside Village. Um, when you go to Claudius Crozet Park, and you go down by the dog park. Yep. We built the bridge across there. Well, it goes right now. Well, and now Corin owns the uh, red light management or Glenbrook or whatever he's calling himself. Anyway, he owns to the left. And by the way, he is very supportive as a developer too. And so is Stanley Martin. Those two actually benefit Crozet. Well, we want to go left through Parkside and that's an HOA that we got to deal with. I mean, we wrote a letter for Dan to help him, but Again, he's being pulled 10 different ways. So right. if somebody yeah. in Parkside Village lives there, I got it right, didn't I? You talk to me afterward. I want to be there all the time, but I'm not clear on what okay. I Okay, and, and that's great. And then, but another issue that you uh, have dealt with a lot is the square. And the idea is once you go through there, you want to be able to go to the square. So we want to make it so people can walk to the square from, I mean, again, it's that connectivity, the walkability. It's environmentally smart. It gets people out. It's exercise. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. I don't have to. Yeah, we, all, we all support the trail. And, okay. and so, is there a possibility in the, in, 
as far as the eastern part of using the um, access to the eastern, you know, connector to acquire land as part of that that process for a park with it. My understanding you know, is that private enterprise is already building or has built already the certainly the street layout and the sidewalks uh, all the way to within 100 yards of the bridge on either side. So uh, maybe a little bit more on the south side. So if the connections are proximal to the roadways, then that's already <coughs> control. Things away from the roadway would not have been done unless the, the development, Westlake or others, or Foothills, or one of these newer ones that's being built right now, they may have put in dedicated greenway trails that were separate that I just don't have in my mind right now. And I should add that that's one thing Dan does is when a new subdivision is going in, now my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but it has to go through him or at least he has to see it. So then where's the trail? Like there's a view of apartments, we brought that up earlier, there's 107. There's actually a trail that runs along a Powell Creek that we're eventually going to build, but it's supposedly in the in the plan, the plot. But that's, the, that's part of his great work because it's much easier to put it on the front end than try to go back and get it after the subdivision's already in. And uh, so in addition to the sort of the passive trail and stuff, um, more passive activities, I, I think we do need to highlight, and something that comes under the master plan about active spaces, fields, you know, soccer fields, things like that. Right now, the only soccer field that you can get to is Crazy Park, really, right? That's the one, it's down at the bottom and it floods, and it's always muddy and always wet if we get any rain at all. Right, I mean, it's, they're always in low areas. Right, I mean, but but you know that, that's the only field, that. right? Yeah. It's the only field, right? Yeah. And so you know, making sure that we have that. I think I mean it is supposed to be accounted for in Western Park, and Ann mentioned some progress, but that's phase one. That's there's no field in phase one. Just continuing to mow the one we have, and then working the trails, there's and parking, and those kinds of things. Right, but um, yeah, it's not, not the additional ones that we saw in the master plan for Western Park, where there's additional fields on that's yeah. later on, right? So the most expensive stuff is being done up front, which would be the drainage of the parking. Yeah. Area. So, sort of $500,000 worth of stuff you have to do to open the door. I agree. Yeah. I agree too. Field spaces. Okay. So, to recap the last couple minutes, because I know we're starting to run out of time a little bit. Um, so, when we're talking about the easements and the need for education, I did make a note on that on there about I think probably through the process, at some point, we're going to need to do a big community engagement push about the Parks and Green Systems chapter or freeway recommendations. Um, so, I think during that, it would be a good opportunity for talking about benefits of trails and kind of our process as besides where we want them but how we get them done. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we can get the HOA staff. Um, we're going to be closing in 15 minutes, so I'm going to ask you to start wrapping it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so of course that will be dependent on us being able to get more people to the table, and I'm sure that you know, as we start to scope out the process, obviously community development will be working a lot with Dan Mahan and Parks and Rec and the trails crew to figure out who needs to be at the table for this and how we can get people that need to be at the table here in the planning process. Um, and also, I know that this is, I work a lot at GIS, Bat Bay. I'm trying to work with Dan right now to get our greenways map. Um, but I think it'd be great to have something that's more updated than this and shows where we can have the gaps, because I think that'll really help make the argument for some yeah. actual yeah. versus proposed yeah. trails. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah I, th I think that, you know, this is an almost 10-year-old map, so. Yeah, that, a better, better trail maps will be, will be great. So, so I think there's an opportunity for us to work together to make sure we have a good, consistent map about and our fact sheet's all correct. So we just loop back to the final questions, if there's anything else, because we're running out of time. Um, I think we've heard about emerging needs, need for active spaces in here. Um, heard about some of the missing key trail and freeway linkages, so an Parrot Branch, east-west, um, connect to Beaver Creek, and then as well as Highlands, following the north side of that railroad track to connect to Park Ridge Road, um, and as well as general connections to downtown and the square. I would like for someone in county government and planning to think about wildlife. It's a total afterthought right now, and it becomes very problematic. You know, as your deer populations grow, where are those animals going, and what sort of traffic problems does that create? And it's a big, messy subject. I don't know that anyone wants to take it on, but I, you know, as long as we're talking about greenways, that is sort of another function of greenways: is how do animals get around? So. Deer across. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And there's a gentleman in, in Old Trail. He comes to our HOA meetings, and he's a, a 
preferred, uh, what do you call it, ortho? Uh, Orthodontist. Thank you, I always slaughter that. <laughs> That's all right. Anyway, he's identified just in Crozet, 50 years, 70, or it was a large number, just walking the trail. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. that, well, to me, is a real benefit. It is. To be able to see that in the middle of Crozet, walking, I mean, Yes, that's right. Yeah. Sure. Are you good? Yeah. Before, before we try, I just need to double check. Did anybody vote against? Uh, we had one abstention. No. Did anybody vote against no. the? Nobody did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so going back to that, uh, I'm going to get those notes, then I will write the resolution and send it out to you guys to look over before we send it out. Wes thought, as, and before Andrew puts his keyboard away, uh, I don't know if green, greenways and those kinds of things are where we would start to talk about forest preservation and tree canopy preservation. Sandy and many others have been raising this, beating this drum for several years, and we're finally getting to the point where we're going to have to go get some authority from the legislature to do more than we're doing now, I think although we haven't gotten into the total weeds about what our current ability to do more is. Um, just because of the loss of the mature trees in the growth area has been so shocking in the last couple of years that it's really gotten everybody's attention. So whether this is the right chapter or someplace else, we just please make a note that we'll come back to that because it's important that we put it language in here. And uh, the other sort of pie in the sky trail for the long distance hikers Dan Mahan for years has had a dream of connecting from Browns Gap Turnpike 697, the walking trail far, far north, all up into the Shenandoah Park, down to Byram, back up into the park, down to Mid Springs, back up into the park, and then over to the tunnel. So that would be something when our grandchildren are <laughs> our age that we might get that done. But the park is willing. They're just buried in not enough staff and storm damage and everything else. But there are, again, those places where there are linkages and easements that people in between, the quarter mile in between. Well, so we should all be thinking about ways that we can help those kinds of projects along too. Thank you. Thank if you. I could do a 30 second alley, um, Ann and I are both on the Blue Ridge Tunnel Foundation Board. Okay. And um, they have actually started restoration of the tunnel after 18 years. And it's with phase three and hopefully VDOT monies that we've been told will come through. Next year, 2020, that is going to be open. You'll be able to go up there, and uh, it's a construction area, so you can't go up there now. But next year, 2020, you'll be able to drive up there, and you'll be able to walk through the tunnel in total about four to five miles there and back. Something to think about. We can now see the light. Okay, at the so uh, <laughs> next week there's the um, bridge, the, the public meeting, whatever, for the um, Right. The Avenue Bridge, and then there's on the 29th, there's the all CAC slash public for base code meeting, which I think everyone should go to. Um, and then, uh, which is probably going to be And then, like I said, next meeting, May 8th, we will not be here. So, which means I will go to a place where I always do. Can we put that on the agenda for next week? Yeah. Yeah. So we have to check the room.